Hey guys, Dr. Gunnan here with part two of my mini lecture series on how to program for resistance training. Now in part two, we will be talking about exercise selection. And if you missed it, in part one, we talked about how to conduct a thorough needs analysis for the athletes and the sport that you are working with. Now, all parts for this mini series are linked down in the description below. So you can check out down there if you missed any of the parts or you can watch through to the end of the video and click on over to the next part in sequence. Now, all of this information comes from chapter 17 from the textbook Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning put out by the NSCA. So this lecture series was originally for my university students, but I thought I would share it with all of you as well. So thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you guys in the slides. Now, this information comes from chapter 17 of Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning put out by the NSCA. And this chapter was written by Drs. Shepard and Triplett. Now there are four primary things to consider when choosing exercises for the program you are writing. The first is the movement and muscular requirements of the sport. For instance, if you're working with a shot putter, then you're definitely going to want to work on those horizontal pressing movements and muscles, right? So chest, triceps, shoulder, obviously there's a lot more to it than that and it starts in the lower body. But just contrast that with somebody like a rower. Guys and girls who do crew have huge biceps and huge lats and big backs because all they do is pull the oars towards them, whereas the shot putter is always going to be pushing away. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't train the opposing musculature, as we'll see here in a couple slides, but we do want to focus our attention on those movements and muscles that directly relate to performance and competition in that sport. We also need to consider an athlete's exercise technique experience. So has this athlete ever trained before? If not, maybe we need to start with a dumbbell goblet squat, or maybe even a bodyweight squat in order to uh, allow this athlete to really ingrain a good squat pattern and coach them from the ground up before we load them. If this athlete has already been training for two, three, maybe 10 years, and they have good technique, maybe they've been coached by a CSCS certified coach before, and they have excellent technique, well, then we can consider implementing more complex movements like Olympic weightlifting derivatives or uh, loaded ballistic movements that might be dangerous for a new trainee but for an experienced athlete, don't pose much, if any, uh, risk of injury. We also need to think about the equipment that's available. Does the gym that you train out of have barbells, dumbbells? Does it only have machines? Do you have bumper plates or just metal plates? Because that will change whether or not you can drop weights on the ground. Is there a wood floor or a rubber floor? Uh, do you have things like a glute ham raise or a reverse hyper? You could write an excellent weight training program in theory, but what happens when you show up on the first day at the job and you find out that the club team you just got a job with doesn't have a weight room and they do all of their weight training out on the pitch, right? And it's calisthenic and they have uh, resistance bands. How are you going to then select exercises to optimize strength and power gains in the appropriate muscle groups? True story, when I used to coach track and field at the high school level, um, I got this job at a local high school. Uh, where I was living and the only thing that they had available literally were rocks behind the building where we met for track practice. There was just this large pile of, of big like landscaping rocks. They didn't have any weights, any uh, funding for even simple resistance bands. And so we did push-ups, we did squats, we did loaded carries with rocks, we did goblet squats with rocks, overhead tosses. And that was our, our weight training because that's all we had available. But we still got those kids stronger, we still made them faster, we still made them more powerful with what we had available. And then finally, the amount of time available to train. So some exercises just require um, a big complex setup and require a ton of gym space and equipment. And so they, may, they may, might not be optimal, especially if you're working in the collegiate environment or the high school environment. And you wanna consider something that's a little bit more simple. For instance, you might not have time to, to pull out and set up uh, a landmine station, right, to do uh, landmine squat to presses, but maybe the athletes can quickly grab a dumbbell off the dumbbell rack and do dumbbell squat to presses. And so the amount of time available might dictate your exercise selection. The next thing we need to talk about are different types of exercise. Now the NSCA uses the word core exercises, and I would say primary exercises, to speak about exercises that recruit one or more large muscle areas that involve two or more primary joints. And, and these exercises should receive priority because of their direct application to sport. So we're talking about things like back squats or front squats or deadlifts or clean pulls or bench presses, overhead presses, chin-ups, pull-ups, big multi-joint large muscle mass movements that are much more similar to the movements that an athlete would be doing on the field. 
Now, I know that most athletes aren't going to be on the field squatting, but every time you jump, it's a squatting movement pattern. And most athletes aren't going to be, you know, lying on a bench and pressing, but most athletes have to throw or push things away from them or deal with an opponent. And so that strengthening that pressing movement pattern and the associated musculature will be much more sports specific than targeting just one joint at a time. Now, the NSCA uses the word core, as I mentioned, uh, core exercises to talk about these types of lifts. And that's confusing because most of the fitness industry uses the word core to refer to your midsection, right? The muscles surrounding and stabilizing your spine. So I don't really like that terminology. I prefer primary exercises. And then we also have assistance exercises, and these often recruit smaller muscle areas. They may only involve one primary joint, and they're considered less important to improving sport performance. Now, again, uh, it, it kind of varies from coach to coach and sport to sport what you would put in the assistance exercise category. And, and oftentimes these are uh, very important multi-joint movements. For instance, for a powerlifter, uh, you would probably consider pull-ups an assistance movement because it does not directly relate to squatting, benching, and deadlifting. However, it does strengthen important musculature that will balance out all of the bench pressing that this uh, powerlifter does, and it could aid in their deadlift performance, but it's not the same movement pattern. Likewise, some coaches might call a barbell back squat a primary lift, but they might call a, a dumbbell goblet squat an assistance lift. Just because it um, typically has lower loads, you can do it for slightly higher reps, and you can use it to sort of add volume to the training when your maybe your low back is already fried from doing your primary sets of back squat. Now, within our core exercises or our primary exercises, we also have structural exercises. These are exercises that emphasize loading of the spine directly or indirectly. So this would be your back squats or your deadlifts right, or your overhead press, something where you are bearing the load axially. And this is important because we have seen in previous videos that our bone and connective tissue responds to the demands that we place upon it. And so in order to encourage uh, increases in bone mineral density and to activate our central nervous system to a greater extent, axial loads are important. So we should not neglect and we should definitely not stay away from uh, exercises that load the spine appropriately. And then we also have power exercises, and these are structural exercises that are performed very quickly or explosively. So oftentimes we think of weightlifting and its derivatives, but these can also be things like kettlebell swings or loaded squat jumps or really any loaded movement that's performed very quickly, so you're accelerating maximally, or that is ballistic. Now we need to select sport-specific exercises, but it gets a little bit murky when you're trying to figure out which exercises have the highest transfer of training to the sport. Now the NSCA textbook specifies that the more similar the training activity is to the actual sport, the greater likelihood that there will be a positive transfer to that sport. And this is what's known as the said principle, or the concept that a specific adaptation will impose a specific demand, otherwise known as training specificity. Now this can be a little bit confusing because oftentimes we immediately consider things that look like the sport to be uh, the most like the sport. So if you have a basketball player who's dribbling a basketball, you might think, okay, well, let's do some tricep pushdowns, some single arm tricep pushdowns, because that's going to improve my basketball dribbling. Uh, in reality, it, it, it's maybe not the case because we want to think instead of the kinetic and kinematic parameters of basketball. So we want to think of the velocities at which the athlete needs to move their joints, the uh, kinetic forces that this athlete has to put into the ground and how, how uh, quickly he or she has to deliver them. We want to think about how high does this athlete need to jump? and what are the prerequisites to being able to jump that high. And in that way, by looking at those aspects of the, of the sport, like we did in our needs analysis, and then we can take a step back and say, okay, well maybe these loaded squat patterns are actually more sport specific than these you know, single arm tricep pushdowns because we're strengthening the musculature in a way that allows it to then take that newfound strength and express it quickly as power, right? And allow this athlete to jump higher. Now this table from the textbook does a really good job of selecting exercises that stress the musculature used in the associated movement pattern, okay? But not all of the exercises that they put in uh, the related exercise category uh, would be primary exercises that you might choose for these athletes. For instance, triceps pushdown, yes, it, it even looks like the dribbling movement in basketball because you're extending at the elbow while your hand is moving towards the ground, just like it would uh, when you're dribbling, but maybe that's not the best exercise to select. And the reason is because we need to remember that it only uses one joint, so it's more of an assistance exercise. Uh, we can't generate as much force or 
uh, as much power as some of these other things like a close grip bench press or a dumbbell bench press. Remember that just because an exercise looks like a movement doesn't mean that it's the best exercise in order to enhance that movement. But some of these other exercise selections are great. For instance, a single leg squat uh, or a forward step lunge to strengthen ball kicking or down here uh, for vertical jumping. We have a bunch of weight lifting derivatives as well as some strength lifts. Looking down at running or sprinting, we have things like snatches, cleans, front squats, and these are bilateral movements, but we know that they are going to contribute greatly to this uh, unilateral running motion because of the kinetic parameters of things like the snatch or the clean or the front squat. We need to be able to overload the force production or the power produ production characteristics of the musculature so that we can then express it better in the sprinting motion. And these lifts do just that. So remember, it's not all about how a lift looks. We also have to assess the kinetic and kinematic profile of the sport and the lift. And are we overloading the force parameters? Are we overloading the power or the velocity parameters? Are we working the right muscles uh, in accordance with the movements that we hope to strengthen? Now, we also want to consider the agonist and antagonist muscles when we're looking at those movements. So muscle balance, of course, is very important. To go back to the example of a shot putter versus a somebody on the crew team or a rower, um, if all you're doing is either pressing or all you're doing is rowing, we need to make sure that we balance out the body, make sure that there's some sort of symmetry in order, A, for injury reduction, but B, because the body will actually limit the force and velocity at which you can move if it feels unstable or unbalanced. So we need to make sure that there is adequate agonist and antagonist development. A great example of this is in sprinters. If all that you do is strengthen your quads and your glutes uh, as a sprinter, right? And sprinters are known for pretty big quads and, and gigantic glutes. And they're known for doing things like front squats and hack squats, especially some of these more muscular uh, 100 meter and 60 meter sprinters. If that's all you do, but you neglect your hamstrings, then there will be a, um, an imbalance of your agonist and antagonist. And especially because the hamstrings really pull double duty because they're you know, flexing at the knee and extending the hip. And so you you put yourself at much greater risk for a hamstring strain or tear if you neglect to train those uh, muscles which are antagonistic to the quads. We also sometimes want to consider exercises to promote recovery. So these might be exercises that don't involve a high amount of muscular stress or high stress on the nervous system. Uh, they might promote movement and restoration. So this could be as simple as just having a light day in the weight room. So maybe you have uh, you know, you come in on Monday and you have a heavy day of training and then Tuesday or Wednesday, perhaps you have a lighter day where you back, you, you back the load off by 10, 20, 30 percent. And so it's, you know, you're working at RPE five or six on all your lifts, but you're still going through full ranges of motion uh, with load. So you're promoting blood flow. You're raising the heart rate. You are, um, you know, moving new blood through the, those muscles. Uh, allowing them to contract through their full range of motion. And this not only promotes recovery, but it also can enhance the uh, movement pattern development and maintenance uh, for these exercises that the athletes are performing. performing. So it keeps their nervous system and their movement patterns in tip-top shape while also promoting recovery. So that, you know, win-win. Now, I think this is kind of a no-brainer, but as a coach, we have to ensure the integrity of technique with our athletes. So they have to have great technique when they're performing an exercise. Otherwise, we need to step in and coach them into better technique. So we should never assume that an athlete can perform an exercise until we've seen them do it properly. You know, it's like the classic high school weight room where the football coach walks over and says, all right, Johnny, today we're doing power cleans. And Johnny says, I don't know what a power clean is, coach. He says, pick that bar up off the ground and put it on your chest, right? And so Johnny does it. And that's a power clean. And he does that for four years. And sure, he gets a little bit stronger, but then you, then you get to college and your coach realizes, okay, Johnny does not know how to power clean or do much else for that matter. So we should never assume that an athlete can do a movement or can handle a movement. We always need to demonstrate and coach and if, if necessary, use some sort of regression, right? Scale it down, scale it back. Maybe instead of power cleans, Johnny should just do some, you know, loaded mid thigh pulls, or maybe he should just do some hang power cleans with the bar or with a dowel first or practice front squats so you get a good rack position. Right? There are a lot of steps that we have to take when we are building up the technique for athletes to be able to do some of these more advanced uh, movements correctly. And then lastly, we've already touched on these uh, and gone into some detail, but availability of resistance training equipment. Again, 
you know, sometimes you have to get creative. For instance, at Point Loma, where I teach and where I, I get to work with the uh, strength and conditioning coaches frequently, we don't have a lot of space. And so we have to get creative. Sometimes athletes are outside doing uh, plyometric type work while athletes are inside doing their strength work and then they switch. And maybe it's not the optimal order of exercises, as we'll see later, but we have to work with what you have. And so availability of equipment will, it should influence how you program because, you know, obviously if you don't have a reverse hyper, you can't program reverse hyper extensions. And then lastly, availability of training time per session. Now, oftentimes uh, this is a, an important limiting factor, A, because if you're working with a collegiate athlete who has classes to get to and a hundred other things on their plate, or even if you're working with a professional athlete, we still don't want to keep them in the gym for two or three hours when there are other things that are far more important for them and they still have to recover between everything. So sometimes you'll want to do things like uh, supersetting two movements, right? Maybe they need to get in a, a squat pattern and a bench pattern. So instead of doing straight sets, you superset them, right? And perhaps it's not entirely optimal for pure strength development or pure power development to do that. But maybe if you don't do that, they would only get one of those patterns in that day. And so you might have to uh, make that concession there. All right, guys, so that was step two, exercise selection for programming in resistance training. Now the next video is going to talk about exercise frequency or training frequency. How often should you train and what factors will affect that? So if you had any questions about this video, let me know down in the comments and I'd love to engage with you there. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on the next video about training frequency.